Okay, so today um, I'm going to be talking about a few different things, and then the last half of the lecture is going to be some live coding. So I've gotten a number of questions um, from different people about, um, with the current system that we have for actions, how do we enable mouse inputs? And so I'll be showing that today when I talk about drag and drop. So we'll be talking a bit about game saving and loading, um, different tools for games, and then uh, how to implement drag and drop, which you'll probably need for the um, level editor part of the project. So let's get started. So game saving and progression. Um, a quick anecdote before this gets started. I remember when I bought the PlayStation 1. I think I was in grade 7. And I bought the PlayStation 1 and an RPG called Wild Arms. Um, which came out a few months before Final Fantasy VII, so it was quite eclipsed by Final Fantasy once that came out. But it was a really, really good game. And uh, that was all my money. I didn't have enough money for a memory card. So I had to keep the system on. That was my method of saving. Like, I couldn't actually save the game. And then, like, seven hours into the game, um, like, someone tripped over the power cord or whatever. And so I... I had to explain, you know, to my mom why I needed a memory card too. So I had spent all my money and I was like, game or memory card? Well, you can't play the game without the game, so I guess I'll get that first. So game saving is very important, especially in games like RPGs, and we completely take it for granted now, but it used to be like a thing that we had to worry about, and it still is a thing we have to worry about, but not so much like having to buy a physical thing, because you can't store um, like a save game on a CD. Right, So you had to store it on the system, but there was no memory on the system, so you had to get a card that you could save on. Anyway, I still have my PS1 memory card. I don't even know if it works, so I don't have a PS1. But that's just a funny story about, about saving games. Um, so a vital part of any game is the ability to save the player's progress at some point. Um, games can be saved in a number of ways. So on computer, typically you have more options than on a console. Uh, but... Uh, you could have, for example, saving the game to a file. So you just click File, Save As in your game, maybe. Um, or you could have a quick save. So if you've ever played like a first-person shooter, like Half-Life or something like that, on a, um, a computer, you've probably abused the hell out of the quick save button. And uh, yeah, it's really easy to beat if you can save and reload infinitely. But then you make the mistake of quick saving while there's a rocket in the air coming toward you and there's no way to avoid it. And so I've completely softlocked a game before by saving, quick saving at the wrong time, or like while you're falling, right? <laughs> Something like that. Um, uh, more in the, in the past, there used to be more of this like checkpoint type saving, and we'll talk a bit about why that was um, in a bit. So save games can be used, uh, can be stored in a number of ways. So they could be stored in a local file, uh, nowadays, you have more and more cloud-saving stuff. So like on Steam, you know, if you go from computer to computer, it'll save your clouds. You could have temporary saving in RAM. Or uh, in older games, they actually had password saves. So the game had no way of actually saving the game. And so what they did was when you typed in a password, it would warp you back to whatever level you were at. And so that was kind of their way of, of doing saved games before you could actually persistently save information. Um, so when you allow players to save their progress is a game design decision, right? So that actually has a lot to do with the type of game that you're making, etc. Um, saving and loading whenever you want can lead to much easier gameplay. So for example, you know, you can quick save right before you try and kill a boss, or even uh, I've played games and I've cranked up the difficulty and it's like every five seconds, pick up a health pack, save, like enter the next room, save, like look at the next thing, save. And so it can really make the game a lot easier if you allow people to quick save and quick load whenever they want. And so sometimes they do things like, oh, let's save after a level, or let's save at the midpoint of a level, or something like that. And so um, you could also have like save at specific locations. So maybe if you're talking about like an old school RPG, maybe you could save when you're walking around the overworld map, but not when you're in the dungeon or something like that. Um, or maybe there's an actual save point, etc. So the easiest way to implement a game save is probably like between levels, right? So if you just have some game where you play level one, 
and then you click, and then you would just store, okay, level one has been completed. Then you play level two, you say, okay, level two has been completed. And it's easy because there's no active entities that we have to worry about. Like, for example, if you do quick save and quick load, you have to save the locations of every entity in the game, right? And then when you quick load, you have to load all the locations of the entities in the game. So you have to think about a system for doing that. But if it's just like Mario, where it's like, okay, now we're, we, we finished 1-1, one, one, so now we're on 1-2, right? And now we're on 1-3. That's a pretty easy way to save. In very simple games um, that don't have quests, inventories, item status, etc., you can just save the level number that we're on. Okay, so we're on level 18 now, right? And of course, when you save your game and you load your game, you've got to be able to display that progress to the user somehow. Um, so that you know, they can know how much they've beaten and how much they have left to go or where they are. And so the simplest possible way to do that is if you have your, your game divided into like levels and then you just display the level number. So we're on level three, four, five, et cetera. And so this was like how it was back in the day and still is for some games. Um, but like here we have in Donkey Kong, we're on level one. Here in Mario, there's eight worlds. There's four stages per world. And so we're on um, world three, one. Another common way to display progress um, is an overworld map, which conveys like a deeper sense of immersion or progress, right? So back here, we just have, okay, world 3-1. That's a bit um, unromantic, right? But here we have this idea of an overworld map. And uh, you can tell when my childhood was because these are the games that I'm like displaying, right? But it's still a good example of, okay, here we have an overworld, and then the levels are sort of these spots on the overworld that I can walk between. And in Super Mario World, for the Super Nintendo, this was probably one of the first really... I guess Super Mario Bros. 3 was one of the first great examples of that, but Super Mario World really took it up another notch. And so we had these like physical sort of thematic worlds within the overall universe of the game, and then within each of these worlds, there were um, levels that you could traverse around. So you can walk back and forth between these checkpoints, almost like nodes on a graph, to show you, okay, that is that level. So they did away with the level numbers in favor of a more um, map or geometric representation. And a really good example of this in a modern game would be Cuphead. Um, I say modern, it's probably five or six years old now. Um, but you know, you walk around this overworld map and then you're allowed to interact with like vendors where you can spend your points that you've gained in the levels and also um, discover and enter the new levels and fight new bosses and stuff like that. Um, so here, for example, uh, is a part of the overworld map where you're allowed to interact with um, a vendor to upgrade your weapons, your abilities, stuff like that. So this is a really cool thing because it, it, there's this physical separation between the gameplay mechanics, right? Where you have an overworld map where you are selecting the activity that you want to do. And then there's a menu scene, which is, okay, now I'm interacting with the vendor or the upgrader or whatever. And then once you select a level, then you're into the gameplay type scene. And so you don't necessarily have to be as fancy as Cuphead, but this is what I'm envisioning for your project, is that you have some sort of overworld map in which you are uh, navigating around to select the level that you want to play next. Um, for the more sadistic players, there is the progress um, of the Atlas in games like Path of Exile, where you literally have hundreds and hundreds of these nodes that you have to fill out. This is a bit of an old screenshot. The Atlas has gotten a bit nicer since then. Um, but yeah, just sort of this arbitrary progress where you have all these things that have meaning. Um, it's like a little bit cloudy here. That means something. Oh, look, there's a texture in the background. That means something. So now I have to play this level because it's influenced by this boss and all this kind of stuff. Does anyone here actually play Path of Exile? Have you ever played it? OK, so it's like Diablo for adults. That's how I describe it. It's, it's, a, re <laughs> it's a really, really interesting. If you like Diablo, you will love Path of Exile and probably never go back to Diablo. Um, I, don't, I don't have stock in grinding gear games. It's just a really, really good game. Um, this is from Heroes of the Storm. Shows kind of your progress with each character as you level up, etc. So displaying progress um, is, uh, is really important. And uh, yeah, so I've already looked at that. Rather than saving, uh, allowing like loading and saving, like the first you know, Super Mario Brothers game, uh, their knowledge of the system, how to save game mechanics, was pretty 
was still pretty young at that point, right? One of the first really popular platforming games. And so rather than let you save your entire progress, what they did um, was allow you to continue. So in Super Mario Brothers, you had three lives. And when you died, or you lost a life, and when you ran out of lives, what you could do is continue from the start of the world. So if you were on level 8-3 uh, and you lost your last life, it would allow you to either restart from the beginning of the game or to continue from, um, from world 8-1. Right? So you could go back to the start of the world. Now, how you implement continue is up to you, but it's, it's really interesting how game mechanics have uh, progressed over the years from this sort of lives and continuing type system into nowadays you can just retry the level infinitely many times and keep going. Um, I do think that uh, there are pros and cons to both, like lives and continuing. You know, it was pretty harsh, but you really did get better at the game, versus now you can just keep trying until you get that one lucky crit or something like that and manage to beat the boss. So it's, it's up to you how you implement it. Neither of these are right or wrong. It's just like a gameplay, um, a game design decision. Um, so whether or not you continue from the same level, the same world, from the beginning of the boss fight, from the middle of the level, uh, it's up to you. And it was very common in early video games when this sort of arbitrary say, uh, game save functionality may not have been possible. So here we have um, from The Legend of Zelda, you know, once you die, you can continue, you can save. Well, that, that game actually did have saving. But when you restarted, you'd go back to, like, your initial spawning position, but you still had the weapons and the lives that you had um, when you started. Uh, here, I always like these sort of cinematic uh, continue um, games. So what these are, which, you may, which may not be obvious, is this is from the arcade game era. And so what they found was that if there was some sort of sense of dread here, right? So, okay, the character's going to die if you don't put in another quarter. Oh, or, um, like, look at how sad Chun-Li is because you lost, right? Like, put in another quarter and continue. There was, like, this sense of you have to go right now. Because if I put in another quarter right now, I can continue from where I left off. But if I wait until that timer is up, I'm going to have to start right back at the beginning. Right? And this made a lot of money over the years. Right? So it's actually like a, like a business logic decision on top of a gameplay decision, which is cool. Um, and you know, also, the game over screen, there's been lots of different continue game over screens. So what happens when you run out of lives, or the, the user has died, or, or whatever? That's, that's up to you. Save points um, are another way, uh, especially in RPGs, that the levels uh, that the games were saved. And save points really make it a lot easier to implement game saving and loading by limiting um, the places where players can save and load. So typically, these were static lo uh, locations away from other entities or dangerous situations. So they wouldn't let you save while you were falling to your doom because that would be a terrible user experience for the player, right? And it also allowed us to save the game without worrying about entity storage. So what do I mean by that? So let's say you're in an RPG game like Final Fantasy VI here. So you've just come from the left, like maybe you were in the overworld somewhere, and then there was a cave. And so, okay, I'll go into the cave, and this is the entirety of the cave, where there's, in the middle, there's a save point. So at the save point, you can use a tent, you can save your game, and then the only thing you can do from here is leave again. And you may say, okay, there's definitely like a boss battle coming up. That's what this typically means. It's like, why would they give me this rest point? Well, typically, they know that a lot of people are going to die at the boss. So within a couple of minutes of finding a place like this, you're definitely going to encounter some sort of scenario where you might die. And so that's a gameplay decision. Like, you don't want there to be like two hours between save points or like, okay, uh, they last saved at this really easy spot. Now they're, they have to work an hour to this hard spot and then maybe die, or they have to backtrack all the way to save. And so this is like a user convenience feature. But also on the implementation side of thing, what they've done is they've made sure that, okay, when the player continues, well, if let's say I wanted to save the game. So I'm, in an RPG, I'm going to have to save like all the items that I have, all the experience that I have, etc. But maybe I, on the overworld map, there's like things walking around, right? Like that I, and if I collide with them, then I um, enter a battle. So if I'm allowed to save at the overworld map, maybe now, um, 
Like, I have to save the position of all those random entities. Or if I'm allowed to save in a boss battle, then I have to save, okay, what frame of animation is the boss on or something like that. But what they've done here is made sure that the user is going to be in a very specific spot that's away from all of those things to make saving just as easy as possible on the programmer. So this is simultaneously a gameplay decision and a game implementation decision. Okay, so it's like at the, it's, it's kind of good that you're hidden from all of these details as a player, right? You don't need to be told all of that. It's just, oh, save point, I'll save right here. But it's, it's really interesting to look at the game mechanics and the game programming involved in actually maving, making a save point like this. And this was very common in old school JRPGs to have this shiny thing to tell you where you can save. And the worst part would be like, oh, I didn't find the save spot, right? I don't know if, you, if any of you did this as a kid or if you played games like this, but, um, you know, like, oh, Dave, supper's ready. And then you're like, but I, I can't. I need to find a save spot first, right? And so this is something that, that I've done many times in my life. It, it was usually true. Sometimes I just didn't want to, you know, leave the game, but. And so in the Dark Souls series of games, um, we have the bonfire. Um, what's it called in uh, the Sekiro games? Does anyone, anyone play this? What's that? Okay, so like, but it's a similar mechanic where you reach a point and then you're like, you're saved from enemies, and then you get to teleport back and forth between these things. Um, similarly, in uh, Super Metroid or Castlevania, we had these things where, you know, the, the process of saving a game took a little while to write to and from memory back in the day, and so there'd be a little animation or something that kept your attention while you were actually doing the saving of the game. Checkpoints are also a thing, so um, levels can sometimes be pretty long, and if you don't want the user to be able to arbitrarily save and load, then checkpoints can be something that you can do. So level-based games may want a progress checkpoint placed within the level, and it reduces frustration, um, because maybe you just got past that hard part, and you want to be able to, if you die past the hard part, maybe you don't want to have to do the hard part again, um, and so you let the user save their progress mid-level. And it doesn't um, allow players to make the game easier or reduce RNG uh, by like a quick save and a quick load, but um, what it does do is something like this. So in Super Mario World, we would have this little checkpoint here. And the cool thing is it would let you choose if you wanted the checkpoint or not, right? So if you touch this thing and then you die in the level, you'll respawn at this part of the level. And in Sonic, um, they had similar things as well. And a more modern example um, from Shovel Knight where you have these checkpoints as well where you can choose to break this sphere and then you'll respawn at those points if you want to. And so checkpoints are pretty easy to implement. Um, if a level has a finite number of checkpoints, then just store the checkpoint number, right? And then when you respawn them, look at the checkpoint number, look up the location of that checkpoint, and then spawn them there. It's pretty easy. So when a player enters a level, um, just spawn them at the, um, the checkpoint where they last saved their game and then reset the checkpoints when the level is completed. So if they reach the end of the level, just wipe all of their um, checkpoint data. So we're talking about saving and loading games. What data do we actually have to save? That's you know, what you care about, probably for your project, and it depends on the saving functionality, right? So if, for example, um, you're just saving after a level, maybe you want to store, okay, here's a list of the levels they've completed. Maybe here's the items in their inventory, um, here's their maximum hit points or experience or weapons, etc. So you want to store um, essentially their progress up to this point so far. Um, if you are saving at save points, maybe you have like a number of quests that you've completed, maybe your party stats, the save point that you used, etc. So that when you load back into the game, you know what save point to go to. Um, but if you're doing this sort of arbitrary quick save, then you basically have to save the entire game state of that scene that you're in, right? So you store um, the entities, like the state of the entity for every entity in the game, each of the entity's components, positions, lifespan, all of that. So if you're doing a quick save and a quick load, that's probably like the most work to implement, but it gives the most freedom to the user in terms of loading and saving. Then when we load a game, um, 
So how to implement loading depends on what data was saved, of course. So if the levels and items were stored, you're going to have uh, to recreate the game just before that level starts, etc., and then give them back those items that they had at that point. If it's a quick save and a quick load, then you have to load back all of the entity's positions into memory somehow. So you could think of maybe having a function in your entity manager that allowed you to save all the details about every entity in the game and then load back the entity manager from a file or something like that. Here's an example uh, if you're using an overworld view. So the game, uh, so you have this overworld, you have some progress and you want to be able to save and load. So the save game is going to store the levels completed. So for example, in uh, Super Mario Brothers 3, which is the first game that I ever saw that did this, you know, Mario might have the fire flower, right? And then it might he might have some um, items in his inventory and also some levels completed. And so those were the things that you would have to save. Um, when the game is loaded, then Mario would appear on the overworld map, maybe at the position last completed, um, with the same items and status that they had before. And so um, the game loading may require you to, for example, quit to the main menu. Maybe you can't do that while you're in the game. You have to make those sorts of decisions. Uh, in a quick save uh, example, um, maybe you could press like, I think F5 is probably the default key or something F6 to, to save your game in a PC shooter. So you press a button at any time to instantly save. And then um, when you press the button to quick load, all the entities and the game progress resumes from when the button was pressed. So like it, it doesn't go to a menu, doesn't go to anything. You just like instantly load the save state of the game that you had. And uh, players can use this to get past difficult areas, know the outcome of RPG, or RNG, et cetera, right? So, okay, I'm walking down this hallway. I don't know what the enemy I'm going to fight is, so I don't have the right um, items. So I'll quick save, see what the enemy is, and then quick load, and then go get the items, and then go back, right? And if you've played emulators, um, which are like computer implementations of consoles, so you can get a, like a Super Nintendo emulator or an Xbox emulator or whatever, um, our computing power now is so much greater on a computer than those consoles that we can actually implement quick save and quick load in an emulator by just literally storing the entire memory of that system, right? So you can have quick save and quick load for console games in an emulator which completely breaks the system, right? Like, I, I remember, like, there was a... I was playing an RPG game, I think it was like Dragon Warrior 4 for the NES, and I was on like one of the harder boss battles, and there was I had like ten hit points left, right? So there's no way I could beat this boss. Um, the average attack that the boss did would just like completely destroy me. And so what I had to do was just quick save, and then if I did a hit and then the boss missed me, then I would load, or then I would save again, right? So, and then okay, well he killed me. Quick load, hit him again. Um, oh he missed me again, so save again, and that was the only way I was able to beat that boss. Now, I could have just like been a decent game player and gone back to my last save point, but who's got time for that, right? So, it lets you abuse the mechanics of the game if they're dependent on RNG. Back in the day, however, um, before they were actually saving data to the console, um, let's say that you had, uh, so you couldn't save to the cart. You could, but they didn't because it was like an earlier game. So we had a password. So the simplest possible case, if you're like, how would a password bring you back to like, the place that you were? Well, let's say the simplest possible password was just typing in the level that you were at. Right? So if you were on level 8.3 of Mario, and then you quit the game, or the power came out, or something like that, and then you started the game again, and they said, enter password, well, if the password was just 8-3, then you would go right back to level 8-3. And so that's essentially what's happening there. So over in Punch-Out, um, you know, you have this long string of digits. Over here in Mega Man, it's essentially the same thing, but they've made it more interesting by putting these, like, bingo dots on this board. Um, and essentially what this is is some encoding of the password. And there's this video here that I've included, um, which is from a YouTuber by the name of Bisquit. And this video actually shows him reverse engineering the password system um, for punch out. And so what do those numbers mean? Well, if you watch this video, you'll find out. Many old and I'm not going to play that here because I have a, um, uh, a long live coding thing that I want to do. But 
those that series of videos on his YouTube channel where he like deconstructs NES game passwords is really interesting. I, I recommend watching some of them. All right, game tools. So now we've talked about like saving and loading. Um, now let's talk a little bit about game tools. And as you make more and more games, you're going to very quickly learn that content creation is the bottleneck to making good games. Um, the programming you can do you know, n in not that long an amount of time, um, but making the content is really the bottleneck. And so over the years, um, content creation has gotten a lot quicker, and the reason for that is because of tools, right? And tools are programs that assist us with creating content for our games, or now, because we have like entire game engines, tools are able to help us create the game itself, not just create the game assets. And so, I mean, back in the day, I mean, I, I have so many YouTube videos that I could show, um, but I don't have time, where you had to like type in, in a text file, or actually, back, really back in the day, in video RAM, right, where you were allowed to store a few sprites, the hex codes for the colors of each pixel that you wanted like Pac-Man to be, right? So you're drawing a circle of pixels with these color values, and then that would be a sprite in hardware that was, was able to be loaded. Um, but now, of course, we can just load up Photoshop or Blender and make a 3D model and just import it into our game. And that's only possible because of tools, right? So the tools to create games are just as important as the games, in my opinion. So many tools exist to help with uh, general asset creation like Photoshop, Blender, pixel art. Notepad is a tool, right? We're able to open up a text file and edit it. And that's outside of our game, so technically it is a tool. And all of these help us with our games. Like, how would you edit a text file if you didn't have Notepad? Or some other equivalent thing, right? It is a tool. It's very, it's very important. So for specific asset creation, maps, levels, etc., cetera, um, there's, our game is probably going to have a specific format for how we want to store our progress, store our levels, etc. And so it's probably the case that there's no tool out there that exists to create our levels for our game. And so in these specific cases, um, we need to construct our own tools for that purpose. And this is what we're going to be doing on the project when you make a level editor. Of course, um, if you are to make a AAA game right now, or you're, you want to make a game to release to the public, or put on Steam, or make it cross-platform, I would not necessarily recommend coding your game engine from scratch. If your goal is to release a game in a timely manner and make money from it, you would probably want to use an existing game engine, right? Because that would let you say, OK, I made this in Unity or Unreal. Now it'll run on a phone. It'll run on on a toaster, whatever, right? Like they, they let you run their, their games on any system. So there's a bunch of uh, popular game uh, engines that exist for creating games and content. So there's Unity, Unreal, Game Maker, uh, Godot, lots of different tools. And so these game engines are more general, like they let you make any game. And so in the sense that they let you make any game, they're probably not like super optimized for making a particular game. So if you make your own very specific game engine, it will probably be, if you do it correctly, a lot faster than Unity for the same game, but then you're going to have to worry about things like cross-platform development, blah, blah, blah. Um, they do a great job of illustrating the power of tools for game, for game creation. Um, so for example, they could come with their own tools for like editing levels, uh, importing assets like textures and sounds, um, editing scripts. Here, for example, you're just like fully editing a 3D world. Imagine having to create this 3D world from like manually inputting the polygons into a text file or something like that. It would take forever. Um, here's just another example um, of creating, creating worlds with these tools. Um, here's another one where you can like shift the road in the game and it like automatically moves the flora and fauna around that thing. Like just things that even like a decade ago were probably impossible, right? Um, you also have tools for, um, I, don't, I think this is Godot. Is this Godot? Does anyone, has anyone used it? Anyway, there's these things called blueprints and schematics in different game engines where you can actually do like coding logic in a visual way um, by making these blueprints um, in your game engine. So lots of different um, tools exist for lots of different purposes. This is not a game engine course, though, so I'm not going to go into a bunch of details about each of those. 
Um, but if your game is not using a pre-existing engine, then you have to create your own tools. And this is so important that we're doing it in the project. And so many existing games um, comes with editors and tools for modding or creating uh, custom content. And the features and power of these tools um, vary wildly from game to game. So over the course of many years of, of games being released, at least in the last, let's say, at least going back like 30 years, I can remember tools being released alongside games for players to be able to create their own content for the games. Um, so the first one I ever used was Warcraft 2. And so Warcraft 2, which I, well, I guess 1995, there you go, it's right on the screen. Um, this game came with its own map editor. So you could make your own maps, and this tool was also created. Um, well, it was created for the, um, for the makers of the game, but then they also released the tool to the players of the game. And uh, so back in the day with Warcraft, uh, Doom, uh, Quake, Warcraft 3, Starcraft, Mario Maker, right? They all have these level editors within them so that it allows the users to create like infinite content on their own. And entire gaming communities were created from these things. And not only that, but entire game genres were created from these things. So who knows what game was created in the Warcraft 3 map editor? Dota. Dota. Dota right? So MOBAs weren't invented in, in Warcraft 3. There was actually a StarCraft map, which was the first MOBA. Um, but Dota was the very first popular uh, MOBA game, and it was just a, a custom level for Warcraft 3. And so you'd log on to Battle.net, play Warcraft 3, and then load up a Dota map. And uh, then that became Dota 2, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, game of all time, right? So, um, at least in terms of prize money. For anyone watched the TI recently? Yeah, so like, huge prize money, not as big as it used to be because they made weird business decisions. Yeah, they changed the, the payout structure, but yeah. So, but all this became, all this was because Blizzard decided to release tools for their game. What a different company Blizzard used to be. Okay. Um, then we have other things. This is called Speed Tree, and like there's an entire company based around making trees in games, right? And so Speed Tree is like you can get it for different game engines, or it may come built in now. I don't know. I haven't I haven't used it myself, but like it's so good at making trees that like you don't have to make your own trees anymore, right? So it'll you put in these parameters, it makes the trees, it puts them there. They can change with seasons. They can have physics where leaves fall off and all kinds of stuff. So just imagine like. Trees are so important in games that there's a company out there who just does trees, um, which I really love because it's like it's such a cool example of tools. So game tools um, are typically made along with a GUI, which includes some sort of menuing system so that you can select, okay, this is the thing that I want to put in. Um, oh, look at this. This is an old slide. We have a GUI. We used to not use IM GUI in this class, so I had that little part. Um, and so the first step of this is going to be implementing drag and drop. So what is drag and drop? Um, typically, this refers to the ability to move an on-screen UI element from one place to another place with the mouse. And we take this for granted, but as programmers making our own game engine, we have to implement this. And so to implement, in order to implement a basic level editing tool for our games, we can actually implement drag and drop via ECS, which is really interesting. And so when it comes to ECS, basically anything we want to do is going to have a component um, associated with it. So uh, we are going to create a draggable component. And anything that has a draggable component can be dragged within our game. Um, so there's different variants of drag and drop. About, and this variant, by variant, I mean like how it actually works. Um, so the literal drag and drop um, would be, OK, I have my mouse hovering over an entity. Then I click down on the button, and I hold it to start dragging. Then as I move my mouse around, the entity moves with it. And then when I release the mouse, I let go. So that's, that's what drag and drop is. You probably all know that. But it's actually kind of annoying in practice. Sometimes you don't want to, have your, to keep your mouse button like held down that whole time. And so what I like doing more than drag and drop is sort of pick up and put down. Okay? So you mouse down on an entity to pick it up. When you release the mouse button, nothing happens. 
And then as you move the mouse around, you move the entity. And then once you find the place that you want it to be, you click again, and then it's put down there. So the sort of pure form of drag and drop, if you want to call it that, is this first one up here. Um, but the one that I'm going to implement and that I recommend implementing is the one down here. I don't really care which one you do, but I'm going to be showing you the second one. So really, really simple. Um, OK, let's have a draggable component. And if it has a draggable component, then it can be dragged. And the only thing that I really need to worry about is, is it currently being dragged? That's it. OK, so we've just attached a Boolean to our entity. Um, and so, oh, geez, what is, this, what is this slide saying? So in our input system, if the left mouse button is pressed, um, we could do something like, OK, get the closest draggable entity to the mouse click position, right? And then get the draggable component right here. And if we are currently dragging it, so what happens on a left mouse click? Well, if I'm currently dragging, then I want to drop it. But if I'm not, then I want to start dragging it, right? So if I'm currently dragging it, so if D, which means that, OK, I'm currently dragging, then I'm going to set D to false. Otherwise, if the mouse click is inside the animation of that D, then I'm going to say, now we're dragging it. So this is kind of backwards logic, right? Because we think of it as, if I click something, pick it up. Otherwise, put it down. So what this does here is it essentially says, if I'm dragging this thing, put it down. Otherwise, if I'm not dragging this thing, then if I'm clicking inside another entity, then I want to pick up that entity. Therefore, I put it down. And what this logic does is it avoids the case um, the reason I get the closest entity to the mouse click position is because if I didn't check this, then you can just pick up like a bunch of things at the same time with the same click, and then it becomes hard to put them down, et cetera. Then we're going to have a draggable system. So we just are going to add a system to our scene in the game. And it says, for every entity, if it has a draggable component and it's being dragged, then set the position to um, where the mouse position is. That's it. So let's do that. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to try and do this live. And if I screw it up, then um, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. <laughs> All right. So here I have, um, and I know this is kind of small, so I apologize for that. But we're going to deal with it. You're going to have the video. So here I have the um, user input system of the game engine. Okay, And I think it's actually easier if I commit a mortal sin and, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I know. It shows up much better on the, on the projector, though. So let's do that. All right. Um, so here we have the user input system. We've seen all of this before. Oh, here's something I did where I, like, I can save screenshots uh, in the game, which is kind of neat. Um, that just, you can just take the window in SFML and save it to a file. It's, it's pretty easy. So what we had before was this idea of um, I have an action map, right? So I've registered actions in the game. So what this does is it says, for example, um, if I have something bound to the H key and I press the H key, do the action associated with the H key. And that was, that's a very good system. However, it's really good for keys because keys are typically things that are rebound. But like mouse movement and mouse clicking, you typically don't rebind things. I mean, you can think of examples in games where you want to like rebind something to the left click or the, like, the H key. But they're few and far between. And if you're going to do that, then I'll let you do that in your own way. But essentially, this system stays the same, where we have these, um, these actions based on keys. But we're also going to implement mouse actions and essentially, the mouse actions are just always passed through. Okay, So if we have a mouse action, that's just going to be passed through to the scene no matter what. So we don't have to register or rebind mouse actions in for, for this course. So if your game for the project ends up having mouse buttons or mouse movement, you don't have to have the ability to rebind those. Because it's just, it's just a little bit annoying. So what we do here is um, I'm going to get the mouse position within the window. 
And then if my event type is mouse button pressed, you've all seen this from assignment two, uh, I'm going to switch on the button type. And it basically says, OK, is this a left, a middle, or a right mouse button click? And then based on that, I am going to have um, a left click, a middle click, or a right click type of action. And if, I'm, if the button is pressed up here, then that's the start of that action. And down below, um, if the button is released, then that is the end of that action. So just like pressing and releasing a, a key on the keyboard, we are pressing or releasing a mouse button. And then there's an additional uh, thing that we pass in here, which is the position of the click on the screen. Right? So the mouse um, interactions actually have, or the mouse actions have a position associated with them as well. So in order to account for um, those positions, we come over here to the action, and now we've added a position to an action. So we have a vec2 um, in our action class that I've added, and that by default is just 0, 0. And then I have two new constructors. One takes in a name and a position, and one takes in the name, the type, and the position. So this would be like the string, which is a left click, the type, which is start, and the position, which is where the mouse button was clicked. And so if you want mouse buttons to interact, or mouse actions to interact well with the action system that we have, this is what I, I recommend doing for your project. Uh, so I'm going to come back over here to the game engine class. And then there's mouse click, a mouse release, but there's also mouse moved. Right? So whenever my mouse moves within the environment, I want an action to be triggered as well. And so mouse movements really, if you think about it, don't have a start or an end. Um, so that type system of like clicking and releasing doesn't really apply to mouse move. So what we have here is just it's an action. It's of type mouse move. And then what I have is where the mouse was moved to. Okay, so we have left click. Uh, sorry, we have um, left click, middle click, right click. Each of those can be start or end. And then we have mouse move. And each of those has a position associated with it. Okay. So over here in my scene, where is it? Scene play dot cpp. Ah, oh, geez. Okay. Well. One second, I'm going to search for um, left click. OK. So I've already implemented um, some of this. I don't want to live code at all, because it's a lot to remember. But essentially now, in my do action system, I have if action name is left click, well, let's do something. So let's print out action dot to string. And to string, which I've created here, um, in my action class, prints out the name, the type, and the position x and y. Okay, so if I run this, please run. Yeah, okay, it ran, um, and then I enter the level. So I'm I'm jumping around, I'm doing the standard stuff in the level, and then over here, I'm if I click, then you can see that it's printing. It might be too hard to to read, but you're able to see that it is printing the mouse position, right? Okay. So that part is done. Now I'm able to actually click in the game world and do something. Now let's also add, we could uh, come in here to the scene play, and I could say else if action.name equals uh, mouse move. I could do the same thing. Was it mouse move or mouse moved? Mouse move, OK, so this should work. OK, so if I go into my game scene and now I move my action, my mouse around, that does not work. All right, so why is that? Well, let's have a look. Mouse underscore move. Oh, I know why. Because this is inside if action.type equals start. But my mouse move doesn't have a type. Um, so what I'm going to do is take this and put it outside of here. All right. So now, if this doesn't work, I'm screwed for the rest of the lecture. So let's, here we go. OK. So we can see now that it is registering the movement of the mouse, and it's printing that out to the screen. So 
Let's get rid of that, because that's super annoying. Um, and I've seen pa people pass in their projects with that enabled. Um, and that actually Im impacts the frame rate of your game, because you're moving your mouse around, and the printing to the console takes a lot of time. And so always disable console prints, because it actually affects the, um, the running time of the game. So if I go back over here to Game Engine, I have some notes for myself. OK, next thing I'm going to do is make sure that my mouse position is correct. right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test. And I'm going to test by actually putting something in the game world associated with the mouse. So over here in my scene play, what I'm going to do is I am going to have a, uh, let's say, a vec2 um, m, let's call that mouse pause, and then I'm going to have sf circle shape m mouse dot, for example. OK, so in my scene play, I have um, something that's going to record the position of my mouse and something that I'm going to be able to draw um, with that. So back over in, actually, I'm not going to do that um, because I don't want to have to scroll through the whole file. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create the circle shape every frame, but don't actually do that in your game. So over here in my scene play, what I'm going to do is whenever the mouse is moved, I'm going to store that position, right? So I have M, mouse pause, and this is going to be equal to action.pause. All right, so now when I've moved my mouse, I'm now storing the position of where the mouse is. And if I have S, render, so I go down to my rendering system, which probably contains some solution code, uh, whatever. I don't care at this point. You should all be <laughs> mostly done this part anyway. So what I want to do is create an SF circle shape. Uh, this is going to be my, uh, my dot, I'm going to call it. Dot, dot, set, fill color, um, SF color red. I'm going to dot, dot, set, radius. Uh, let's say, what can you see on that screen? Let's make it 8. Uh, dot, dot, set, origin. I'm going to set this to 8, 8. So the dot is drawn on the center of the mouse rather than the top right of the mouse. That's what the origin does. And then uh, M, window, or sorry, M, game, window, dot, draw, dot. OK. So have I forgotten anything? Anyone paying attention? Looks good. Yep. Ah, look at you paying attention in class. That's amazing. Good job. I didn't do that intentionally. I thought I had done everything. <laughs> so I'm going to set the position. And this is going to be um, m mouse pause dot x, m mouse pause dot y. OK. So let's run it now, and let's see what happens. OK, I go into my game. And now I've got a dot being drawn at my mouse position. But notice that if I go back and then go into the level, where's my dot? I haven't moved the mouse yet. So no mouse event has happened. It only happens when it moves, right? So you may encounter some edge case bug if you're expecting the mouse if you're expecting that mouse pause to be at the mouse position, but you haven't moved it yet, so just deal with that. Maybe at the start you you fire the mouse position um, event or whatever. But as soon as I start moving it, here's my dot. Okay, now I can click, click, clickety click, click. Now let's uh, let's do this. Let's uh, let's run through the level. Oh crap! Right. So what we have here is the canonical mouse problem, is that the mouse position is in what? What coordinate system? Window coordinate system. But my game world is in game world coordinate system, right? So what we have to do is translate that somehow, OK? Now, it turns out that that's actually pretty easy in this case for our game. But in general, it may not be that easy. Um, so what I'm doing next is this window to world function. All right, so over here in my scene play, 
I have made a function which is called window to world. So what that does is it takes a mouse position or any position in window coordinates and converts it and returns it as world coordinates. Okay? So if I go to scene play, and I think I made it already right down at the bottom, then what this does, just to save time, I've already typed this. So I get the games, the window's view, right? Because the window is currently viewing a part of the game world. And then I say, okay, I'm going to get the center x value, right? So that's the center of the game's view. And then I'm going to get the window size dot x divided by 2 and subtract from this. So this is essentially, if the game has scrolled at all, this is going to kick in and move my mouse position over to the right. This formula is not necessarily the formula for every possible game, right? And in here, I'm actually cheating a bit because I'm calculating this new x, and that is the, the Windows x that I have to add to the original x to get the correct x position but I'm just passing in the mouse position in the window y, and the reason I can do that is because my game is never moving in the y direction. So I'm cheating here, and I'm not going to give you like a, like a completely general formula for doing this because you're going to have to do this for the project, and I don't want to give you the solution to that. But the, the solution to doing this is that if I have mouse move, and so I can, there's one way to do this, is this is sort of like the purest way, where I literally have the mouse position in the window being stored, right? So, okay, this is the, like, M mouse pause is the position of the mouse on the window, right? And then what I would have to do is, <clears throat> excuse me, come down to the uh, rendering system, and when I do this, I'm going to say, okay, uh, vec2 uh, world, pause equals window to world m mouse pause and then this is world pause and world pause okay so this is sort of the purest way of doing it where i don't modify the stored mouse position just wherever i want to use it i convert it but what we could have done is instead of storing the the mouse position with respect to the window i could have called window to world at that point and then stored the mouse position within the world. But the problem with storing the mouse position within the world is that maybe later I'm going to have a UI element where I want to get the screen relative position of the mouse instead of the world relative position of the mouse. So my rule is kind of store where the mouse is in the window, and then whenever you want to use the mouse position for something, convert it to um, the world coordinates. So if we look again and see if I have coded this correctly, hopefully I have, then as I scroll over to the right, um, yeah, so now my mouse is properly following me. But because I haven't changed the Y position, if my Y was moving up and down, I, it wouldn't be properly, properly following. But now I do have um, where I can actually click this. But look at this. What I've done over here, I'm way over to the right now, and if I click up here, I'm still, this is like zero, zero, that's printing out. And the reason is, when I'm actually in the action system with the left click, I haven't converted this to the world coordinates yet. That's still in window coordinates. So I have to be careful in the next step. So the next step to drag and drop is going to be detecting if I've actually clicked inside something. And so I need to convert the coordinates there as well. But first, <clears throat> what are we going to do? Um, OK, so detect if an entity is clicked. So inside my scene play, uh, crap, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to have another function. This is uh, bool is inside. And I'm going to take in a vec2 pause and a vool. Yeah. I heard someone laugh, so I knew I made a typo, and then I looked. <laughs> All right, so standard shared pointer entity e. Oh, I should have written all this beforehand and just explained it to you rather than looked here. Okay, so what I have here is I have a position and I want to know if it's inside an entity. So the entity has a uh, get component 
see animation. Um, and this has a size. Bracket, yeah, okay. There we go. Dot size. Thank you. Someone paying attention. I can't code on a laptop. Auto anim equals. Dot animation dot size. Jeez. Get size. All right. So that is the animation. Um, this is also going to have a position. So this is vec2 pause equals um, e get component c transform dot pause. All right. So now, if how do I detect if it's inside something? Well, this position is the middle position, right? So the middle position, I've got a size over 2 in the x and the y position that I need to see if it's within. So if, uh, let's see here. If, oh, geez, this is another pause. So this is e-pause, I guess, because I've got my pause up here. Uh, not my pause, but my POS. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help. I have four cats, so I'm always talking about pause. All right, so if pause.x is less than, no, greater than, so this is the left side check. This is epos plus um, epos.x minus anim, this is the get size, so this is vec2, right? Yep. So this is going to be, let me just call it s, s.x over 2, right? That looks correct, I think. And Pause dot x is less than e pause dot x plus s dot x over two, and pause dot y is greater than e pause dot y minus s dot y over two, and pause dot y is less than e pause dot y plus s dot y over two. Ugh. All right, let's standard c out. Um, this thing, animation, dot name, get name. Dear Lord, work, I'm running out of time. Okay, you guys do your assignment while I'm watching and see how fun it is. All right. <laughs> and also have it be released to YouTube. Um, okay, so is inside. Now I'm going to go to... Left click. Now, in here, I'm going to say for auto e in m entities, entity manager dot get entities. Right now, I have this. Um, if is inside m mouse pause. Oh wait, what did I miss? World. Uh, w pause. This is my world position. So this is where I convert mouse pause to the world position. So this is the W pause. Why is this constantly happening? Thank you. Okay. It's so weird like to have it uh, constantly updating. All right. And this is E. Now I'm going to do something. So let's do this. Oh, this build errors. Where's my error, guys? Come on. I only got five minutes left. Is inside must return a value. Oh, yeah, that's important. Um, return true. And return false. Can't spell false. All right. OK, so now we're in the game. Click. OK, I've got the left click, so that's still coming up. But now if I click inside here, ah, OK. So it printed out question, if you can't see it. Now it's going to print out pipe tall. All right, bush big and stand, right? Because I've clicked on two things, both uh, Mega Man 
and the thing behind it. So, all right. Whew, all right. The hard part's over. Now, what do I have to do? I have to add a draggable component. So let's go into our components. Um, class C, draggable. Public component. Uh, public bool dragging equals false. All right, now I need to add that to the entity. Up here, C draggable. There, added to that. Now, the next thing to do is set the drag variable if it's clicked. Okay, so over here, um, if it's inside, so is inside, if it's inside, then if if E has component C draggable, then E get component C draggable. Dot dragging equals true. Okay. Now, what I need to do next is actually make a dragging system. So let's do that. Void scene play s drag. Over here, scene play. Now I've got my scenes. Void s drag. All right. In my scene play, in update. I need to call the drag function, and then I need to go back to the drag function. All right. So in here, what I want to do is any entity which has a draggable component that is true, I want to set its position to the mouse position. Okay. So for uh, auto e in m entity manager. Okay. Stop working on me. Okay, it just decided to be red. Um, if <laughs> E has component um, C draggable and E get component C draggable dot dragging. So if it has the component and it's dragging, then vec2 w pause equals window to world uh, m mouse pause and then we are going to say e get component c transform dot pause equals w pause <sighs> oh yeah thank you All right, let's see if this works. Ha, huh, meant that. It's going to keep you on your toes. Okay, going to level. Click. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Load level. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nothing is draggable. All right, load level. Um, do, do, do. Let's say tile. Okay, all my tiles. Tile, add component, C draggable. This is why I do it live, right? Because you actually put down your phones and because you want to catch my errors and laugh at me. <laughs> All right. Hey, look at that. Now, this is insanely cool. Because I'm doing it while I'm playing, I can do stuff like this. Like, right? It doesn't like, it, there's weird interactions, of course. 
Um, but yeah, like that's pretty neat. Now, <clears throat> the last thing I need to do is, oops, 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 <laughs> right? So I'm going to kind of stop here because you get the idea. The last thing I need to do is make sure, oh, actually, I can stop. <laughs> so there's, there's error checking here, right? I don't want to be able to pick up two things at once. And I want to be able to drop things as well. Uh, let's just do the dropping. I've got a couple of minutes. OK. So the dropping, whenever I left click, go back to scene play, left click. OK. Inside left click, now for every entity, if, so this is going to be um, detect the picking up of entities. So if I'm in here and I click on an entity, maybe I don't want to be able to do it to two entities. right? So if I don't want to be dragging two entities, what I can do first is check to see if any entity is currently being dragged. And if an entity is currently being dragged, then don't go into this part. Okay, so maybe I can have a function which says, is entity being dragged, or something like that. Um, or if you want to be maybe like super efficient about it, you could keep a vector of the entities that are being dragged, or maybe record the, the entity that is being dragged so that every frame you don't have to iterate over ent every entity to see if it's being dragged, et cetera. I'm not going to do that part. What I will do is say, um, if this is draggable, and because by default, if I'm dragging something, then my click is going to be inside its animation. right? So that's a little bit of a cheat. So if it has draggable, um, I'm going to say if if this is not true, then continue, right? So I'm going to just discard all of the ones that don't have dragging. And I'm going to say if, so um, auto dragging equals this. So I'm creating a reference to this. So if I update this, it will be changed. And now I can say if, if not dragging, Drag equals dragging. Oh, wait a minute. I can just do this. I think I can just toggle it, right? You want to see any logic with that? Okay, Ben gives me a thumbs up, so I know it's right. Um, okay. <laughs> so it still picks it up, and if I am dragging it, it should toggle it, and it puts it down. OK, so we've got drag and drop. So now you can think about how you might, in your level editor, have something like this, where when I click on this button, it creates a new entity. Now I'm dragging that entity around, and now I click to place it somewhere in the level editor. However, in the level editor, what you're going to do is make it so that when you drop an entity, it snaps to this grid. Right? Because we want the level to probably operate on a grid type structure just to make it a bit easier on everybody. So that's drag and drop. You can see how ECS makes it easy. Not only that, but let's do, do I, oh, I have a couple of minutes. OK, let's, let's show you something that's really cool. Um, let's go back to um, add component, see draggable. Let's take that out. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to come back to uh, bullet. That's a spawn bullet. Spawn, shoot bullets. Collision system. OK. If a bullet collides with a tile, give it a draggable component. Let's see if this works right out of the box. OK, so I'm in my game. I cannot drag this tile. I can't drag this tile. I can't drag this tile. If a bullet hits it, now I can drag it. 
So you can have like a dragging gun, right? Where I shoot it and it gives it a draggable component. How hard would that be in anything but ECS? Right? So this is kind of like one of the powers of ECS. Well, if I can shoot that one, well, I gave it a dragging component. Maybe, maybe this will be funny as a bug. Yes, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, there's a few kinks to work out, of course. But um, like, does it work with, is this a tile? I don't know, is that a tile or a deck? Oh, it's a tile apparently, right? Yeah, so I can drag this around. And you can see how um, in your game engine, you may want to consider this, something we haven't considered yet, is that the, action, the order of drawing things matters, right? So look, this background tile in the background, um, that was drawn before the pipe, and this cloud was drawn after the pipe. And so in a, like a completely arbitrary game engine, you may want to actually store like drawing layers and stuff like this. It's, you can see how, how that would get, but for now, it's just the order that matters. And then we can do things like, uh. <laughs> it's pretty cool, I think, anyway. Or you can also have the gun remove the draggable component, etc. All right, so that's game tools, saving, drag and drop, that is going to be one of the key features to implementing um, your level editor. And so in terms of, uh, you, have a bit, you have it a bit easier than previous classes because they never had IM GUI, so they had to come up with their own way of like spawning entities via hotkeys or drawing their own menu or something like that. But have a, an IM GUI that lists all the assets, click on an asset, creates a new entity, then you add a draggable component to that and you stick it somewhere in the level. And that should be good to go. Oh my god, I made it. It's, it's before the end of the cutoff. I wouldn't mind so much if the video didn't cut off, but I had to, had to squeeze everything in now, so thanks. <laughs>